Praise the Lord. Are you happy this morning? Amen. Let's just stand, look to the Lord. Any prayer requests before we start? Yes, Dave, yes. Unspoken, yes. And um, May's stepfather as well. It's And your brother Charlie, okay, yes. All right, then let's all lift up our voice together. Heavenly Father, as we come before Thee, we thank You, Lord, that we can come before Thee. We thank You, Lord, for this day. But, Lord, You've seen the prayer requests, Lord, that's gone before Thee. Lord, You knew them before we even asked. But, Lord, we are asking, Lord, that You meet the needs this morning, whether it be body, soul, or spirit. Lord, we have come here to worship and to praise Thee this morning. We're asking now in that precious name that's above every name, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. You may see it this morning, and I'll have the song leader come lead us in the song service. Morning. It's nice to see everyone this morning. But for the blood shed on Calvary's but for there'd be no hope for you.
move on me Holy Spirit
309 in the blue book. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Let's just love Jesus. That's why we gather here in His presence. Nothing else matters. Worship. Do 326. 326 in the blue book. 
326 in the blue book, yeah. Only real peace that I have, dear Lord, is in you. The only real peace that I have, dear Lord, is in you. Life's frustration. I need you, I know that I do The only real peace that I have Dear Lord, is in you Thank you, Father, thank you, Lord The only real peace that I have That I have, dear Lord, is in you. For all life's frustration, I need you. I know that I do. The only peace that.
that is within me and you'll praise the hurt away if you just praise his name when you're up against a wall and your mountain seems so tall and you realize life's not always fair you can run Let the old man decide, or you can change your circumstance with a prayer. When everything falls apart, praise His name. Have a broken heart, just raise your hands and say, Lord, you're all I need, you're everything, and you'll take the pain away. When it seems you're all alone, just praise his name, when you feel you can't go on. Just raise your hands and say, Greater is He that is within me, and you'll praise the hurt away. If you just praise His name, Praise His name When you have a broken heart Just raise your hands and say Lord, you're all I need You're everything to me And He'll take your pain away Praise His name, and you feel you can't go on. Just raise your hands and say, Greater is He that is within me, and He'll take your hurt away. How can you be lonely when everything falls apart? Just praise his name when you have a broken heart. Raise your hands and say, Lord, you're all I need. You're 
everything to me and he'll take your pain away when it seems you're all alone praise his name when you feel you can't go on just raise your hands and say great within me and you'll praise the hurt away if you just praise his Sister Crystal, would you have a song this morning? same old road for miles and miles if you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies if you're trying to fill the same old holes inside there's a better life there's a better life if you've got pain He's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you've got chains, he's a chain breaker. We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. We've all run to things we know just ain't right. There's a better life. There's a better life. If you've got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you've got chains, he's a chain breaker. If you've got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you've got chains, he's a chain breaker. You've been walking the same old road for miles and miles. If you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies. 
If you're trying to fill the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There's a better life. If you've got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. saving he's a prison shaking savior if you've got chains he's a chain breaker if you need freedom for saving he's a prison shaking savior if you've got chains he's a chain breaker Praise the Lord. Just appreciate being here this morning and the song and song really touched the chord of my heart. I probably have gone through one of the hardest week I've ever had, I think, in my life. And uh end up with uh, quite a severe quarrel with my son last weekend, last Sunday. That pretty much ripped the heart right out of my, my chest. I just thank God that he's a non-time God and in the last couple weeks We have our house for sale, so we had packed up some stuff, but I come across a, a contender dated back in 1988, which is before the, my time here, concerning a Christian family, marriage, and how to bring up your children in the eyes of God. I've always appreciated Raymond Jackson, how he put messages together. His sermons could have been hours long, and he just kept me right on the edge of my seat and just think, oh, it's already over. However, the words in, those contender, in that particular contender really hard touching I know the words that were uttered from my son was weren't from the depth of his heart he was under the influence of alcohol but I'll tell you uh, I left home at a young age and learned fairly fast my dad left me, left us at a, at a young age. I grew up fast, I did. Like my oldest brother would say the very same, he which he did a few weeks ago. So many things that took place in that short piece of time here that reflects to what I'm saying today. I've been around and always protected myself. You're gonna throw a punch at me, you're gonna be prepared to hear, you're gonna receive one. Yeah. However, when this happened with my son, I did not exchange words with him. 
but I just let him know freely. Do you want me to remove yourself from your presence? Lose my number. More or less, it was probably one of the worst nights. I really believe I looked through back to last, I'll be 55 in June. I don't think I've gone through something like that. I'm just glad that I have God to turn to. Yeah. It was hard to find comfort, but I did. But a second, I've been working out of town, and the gentleman that's staying with me said, I, I don't think I've witnessed anybody fall asleep so fast. Little did he know, though, that I was praying to my Heavenly Father, and he did give me a peace. So this week's gone by with certainly thoughts. You try to keep focus on God, but Satan there always pokes around and put IDs in your head and I could just not imagine spending the rest of my life and being separated from my own flesh from my son that he'd have nothing to do with me and uh, long behold he uh, he was around Friday still not wanted to have he even looked at me or kept our distance and uh, he came back yesterday, and I could just feel and sense. Uh, he came standing around. We were working around the pastor. Our cows been getting out every day, so we had to reconstruct. And uh, I just reached out and uh, gave him a big hug, told him I love him. And he did so. Although he did not apologize for his actions, I had already forgiven them of the action that he took Sunday night. I'm thankful that I know my Heavenly Father because had, not, had it not been, I think it would have been a serious night, more so than what I, the blows I took because I would have given them back. It's God's love reaches far beyond our understandings at times. I really believe so. I've failed him many times, and I know. Reading that contender, Raymond Jackson made a statement. What would you think if you've done wrong and you've gone to your prayer closet and then you would hear an utterly voice and our Heavenly Father just yelling at us? It's not so. No. Yeah. He's forgiven us immediately. Plans from his, our mind, his mind. So, as we walk daily, it is important to be close to our Heavenly Father and, and stay in correction and whatever it be from the, this pulpit or from reading the Word, however He's going to address it. But to put on that Christ-like mind, Sometimes it's pretty hard. At the beginning of time, he was a creator. Into existence, he spoke the heavenly blue. When the night shook up his hands, he threw out the stars and he knew where they land. So if you think 
You're drifting like along Well, I have good news If he hung the moon I know he will help you If he holds the sparrows and fly He holds you too Consider the lilies in the field Much more he loves you In the beginning of time You were on his mind When he hung the moon When you feel like the world Is hurt on your shoulder And if your close friend in life is pulling away Though you have tried so hard and long There is still hope Just look to the crowd There you'll see Just how much the Savior Still loves you today He hung the moon I know he will help you he holds sparrows and fly, he holds you too. Consider the lilies in the field, how much more he loves you. In the beginning of time, you were on his mind, he hung the moon. If he hung the moon, I know he will help you And if he holds the sparrows and fly He holds you too Consider the lilies in the field How much more he loves you At the beginning of time The year on his mind When he hung the moon on the moon I know he will help you And if he holds sparrows and fly He holds you too Consider the lilies in the field How much more he loves you In the beginning of time Year on his mind, he hung the moon. Yes. Hey, Paul, I was uh, in my heart this morning. I was going to testify or something. But because of your testimony this morning, you brought me back to a, to a time in my scenario. He was uh, in high school, and he was going through a very rebellious stage at that time. And I remember one day, we, outside, we always we take the blows almost. And, uh, He's a lot younger than me. But I remember it wasn't it wasn't a good feeling. And I and I know you people talk about feelings, but it wasn't a good feeling. And uh, he ended up going to Montreal. When I look back, it was the best thing that ever happened. Not because I wanted him to go to Montreal, but there was a change when he was there. I remember another time. I went to bed. And I got up. My son Mary was in the room. He was bleeding. His pants was ripped. 
and I didn't know what was going on. This is about 3 o'clock in the morning. Well, I know exactly one or three was it. I know it was late after I went to bed. And he went. I had just got a, a new car. And he went, maybe I should, I'm not saying this to hurt my son. But I guess this was a common thing in high school that they go and they take your vehicle for a joyride. And that's what he did. He waited until I went to bed and he took the keys. Didn't even have his license. Went down, I think it was Burke Road. We're walking and he came back on Burke Road. And it was in the winter time and he lost control of that car. And he hit the culprit, he hit it so hard that the wheels, the front wheels was so far away from the vehicle. I, wa I went with him and I saw the vehicle. And I couldn't believe it. I got, it's a miracle that he was still alive. Yeah. And what I'm trying to say is that my heart, it didn't matter about the car. I didn't care about the car. It had nothing to do with the car. Yeah. But that's how, that's how God works. Yeah. He can change your heart. I didn't have any bitterness because he took the car. The next morning, we sat down with him at the table. And we talked to him very calmly. And that's not my nature. <laughs> you ever been there? Yeah. But we sat down and we talked with him. And I told him, I said, you're going to have to pay this fine. You're going to have to make this right. And sure enough, he, had, he ended up paying the fine, but he, nothing more came of it. trying to say is that my wife and I when God called me in 1977 it wasn't I don't know how long it was after it wasn't very long we had left the Catholic Church and we had people in our homes And they said, there's going to be a separation. Separation. My wife and I, we just left the Catholic Church. We came into this message. So wonderful, so exciting. And us being so young. Separation. I never understood it then. I didn't even know what was going on, my wife and I. I got a hold of a tape. Brother Jackson preached a message. The winds are necessary. And after I listened to that message, I knew this was going on even before we come into the, this message. The winds were blowing then. And the winds are still blowing now. They're blowing even harder now. But through it all, the first separation, the second separation, and I'm not saying this to lift me up by God's grace. We are fully trusting in God. Yes. We are leaning upon those everlasting arms. Yes. If I would have put my trust back then in an individual or people Where would I be today? Right Only by the grace of God that God knows my heart. And I'm not saying this to hurt anybody. I'm just <coughs> telling you what I've been through, what I've experienced, and the comfort that I have is when I lean upon Him. For Him to show me what to do, where to go, and allow the Holy Spirit to keep this 
I don't really remember. That is what I want. The Holy Spirit to lead and to guide me and the Holy Spirit. And today, my son, I'll tell you, I, he'll do anything for me today. And it's not because of what I did. It's because we have prayed that God would change his heart. Yes. And he has changed his heart. Yes. There's been a change in it. And I thank God that God is still on the throne and he can still change people's hearts, even our children. Yes. But try to do something on your own. <coughs> As my brother testified, he came to that place of forgiveness. God forgives us. Why can't we forgive those? Yes. So, praise the Lord. Amen. Yesterday, I was outside working. And the guy across the street, he does a lot of things for me. He came over and he said, would you give me a hand today? He said, uh, 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 I just need a hand. And it's just short. It just, it was natural. So I went and I gave him a hand. And after I, it was all done, he said, two are better than one. And I thought, that's scripture. That's, that is scripture. Two is better than one. To have somebody that you can, that'll lift you up, that'll encourage you, that when you're all alone, you feel all alone, you have a brother or sister that's going to encourage you, lift you up. Think about that. But you know, if you've never been in that place alone, how would you know? But anyway, I thank God. I thank God for your testimony this morning, brother. Because I know it's God that change, changes the heart. And God knows my heart. And I pray that He will continue to lead me and guide me. Because I want to be there. Amen. Praise the Lord. He is worthy to be praised. Sister Brenda, would you have a song this morning? We've all had rough weeks. And all week long I've been saying, don't lose your vision of Jesus. As we travel along this pilgrim way, we have hearts, burdens to bear. But with the vision of Jesus and heaven in view, our cross is much lighter to bear. Don't lose your vision of Jesus. Keep your eyes ever on Him. Many friends and dear loved ones have lost their way. They have lost their vision of Him. Don't ever look back. Just keep traveling on. For there's nothing in this world of sin. Don't ever look back at the earthly cares Lest you lose your vision of Him And I remember the time I remember the place 
where Jesus so sweetly came in and how he took all my burdens that I felt so long since I first had a vision of him so don't lose your vision of Jesus keep your eyes ever on him many friends and dear loved ones have lost their way they have lost their vision of him so don't lose your vision of Jesus keep your eyes ever on him many friends and dear loved ones have lost their way they have lost their vision of him. don't lose your vision of Jesus keep your eyes Ever on you. Many friends and dear loved ones have lost their way. They have lost their vision of you. Oh, don't lose your vision of you. Praise the Lord. I know when we first got saved, we thought, well, there was been some trials. Surely when it gets along a little later, when we get older and we're on the road, it's going to be, the trials will be a whole lot easier. It's not that way. <laughs> Let's just stand for a moment, change the position. Lord, we come at this time, Lord. Seek in thy face, Lord, whatever you would have us for us this day. Lord, as we look into your word, I just pray, Heavenly Father, that you use this vessel as of clay as you would see fit. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. You can be seated this morning. If you have your Bible this morning, one turn us to start as in John chapter 17. And in the 17th chapter, this was near the end of 
Jesus ministry. And maybe we could start at the uh, 16 verse or 15. Uh, we can keep backing up, I guess. It says, I pray not for thee that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from evil. That they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. He's talking about believers. To child of God. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And as thou hast sent me into the world, even so I send them into the world. And for their sake I sanctify myself that they might be sanctified through the truth. Yes, sanctification has been an original doctrine. Actually, Jesus spoke about sanctification. The apostles in the early church spoke about it as well. But as time from the early church we knew as from the Apostle Paul, from there truth started to go downhill and a lot of revelation was lost by the time you came to Luther. But Luther was a man that God used. And he was a, a Catholic monk to begin with. But it doesn't matter where you're in, if you're a true seed in God's appointed time, He'll wake you up. It's something you can't explain. Before you were concerned about your natural life, how the world went, you had certain objectives to do, and how things would go. But when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you, there's an interruption. Your outlook changes. You may not know everything or understand everything, but the Creator knew you before the foundation of the world. He knew what you're going to speak. He knows what the work he's called you for. It's not a surprise. Oh, my goodness. Here's Martin Luther. Well, what a wonderful thing. No, he knew, he knew that all along. But it took the Holy Spirit to take and to put anointed that seed that it start to spring up. And so God was on a place of restoring back his truth and from the 15, uh, 1500s, it took a long time till we reached the 1900, the 20th century. God was not in a hurry. There was a lot of things in the world that was taking place at the time, but God knew exactly what was taking place. And so he got a hold of a man called Luther. And Luther had a backbone. Any child of God is going to have a backbone. Because that spirit that's in you has the power to change you. God's not going to leave you in the state that you're in. Although at that hour, God was just only requiring to Luther, the just shall live by faith. And I read that scripture that Jesus says, I sanctify myself for them. Not only the disciples back then, but whosoever God would be dealing with it with his children. Now when he says, I sanctify myself, now there's something we need to understand. We read it and sometimes, oh yes, Jesus sanctified himself. But what did he mean by that? He had no sin. So does it mean... Sanctification means getting rid of sin, per se. The fundamental principle is Jesus was saying, I dedicate myself to the Spirit of God. And it will make the change 
in the believer's life. Now this sanctification that he's talking about, yes, he preached about salvation. But he says, these will be sanctified through the words they speak. He was not just talking about just cleaning up the old man. They were clean because when you talk about sanctification and being sanctified, and because Jesus died on the cross of Calvary for you and I, by one sacrifice are we sanctified. That means it's pointing to the origin of sin, which is unbelief. Yes, as young believers, we look at, oh, is dealing with, I shouldn't smoke, go to dance hall, uh, gamble, whatever. Yes, those are natural things. But when you came to Jesus Christ, and you came to the altar, and our experiences vary as our faces vary, and God knows exactly what he's doing. As he touched you and brought you, without you trying to clean the old man, he done something right away in your life. Some stopped smoking right off the bat. Some stopped cursing right off the bat. Without even do, do anything. But it's because of the word. And the power of that word that comes in. The Holy Ghost inside will cause that believer, if he's dedicated to walk with the Lord, that will remove some of those things. Because remember, this old body is not going to be redeemed till we come into the rapture or, or our bodies changed. Right? So we have to keep that in subjection. Now what is sanctification? It means to be cleansed. And when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, what does the blood wash us? Cleanse you, make you clean. Can I hear it? Unbelief? Right. So because of unbelief, there's a blood sacrifice that we are clean, a child of God is clean. Yes, he may make some mistakes. But God's prime directive is getting his word in that believer. Because if the word can get in, and the Holy Ghost working in, it'll start removing some of the things you don't like. And then sometimes, well, God done everything that when I came to the, to the cross, when I came to the altar, why didn't he take all these other things out? You allow that for our growth. Can you imagine if we came to the altar, everything was done? Now, there was a doctrine in the beginning of the turn of the century, the 1900. The eradication of the old man. The second work of grace. Because the Holy Ghost had done so much on Azusa Street, and the power of God was so great, a lot of things were gone. And then, in time, after that's in the 1906 around the area. By the time you reach 1912, men start to, looking at things. Well, yes, yeah, sanctification. God's going to get rid of everything you have. You'll, you won't sin again. They were looking at the natural side rather than the spiritual side concerning the word of God of unbelief. But if you can deal with the unbelief part, it will take care and remove the things that, that's going around, that, would, that shouldn't be there. First of all, can any of us remove anything like that from our lives that still may be there? Maybe you didn't pray enough. Maybe you didn't run far enough. Or hear enough word. Now it's the Holy Spirit that makes the change. It will point out some things that are not right. And he's going to put you through the ringer. Well, I don't want to go through the ringer. Yeah, you have to go through the ringer. Till you get to the place that that dies out of you. But it's the Holy Ghost because of the word first that sees you clean. That will start working and removing the things that God don't want in our lives. Yes. 
Now when we... Okay. I, what's happening... Sometimes, if we're not careful, we lose sight of what sanctification is. And I'd hate to see us drift back into the old doctrine that at the turn of the centuries, different men that had tried it, that the eradication of the old man. And some of them thought, well, we got it, I got it made, I'm not doing anything wrong, what not. And he might have been walking for a year or two, and then all of a sudden, something hits. And the old man flies off. It's putting the cart before the horse. It's the Holy Spirit first. So if we're cleansed, and Jesus says here, and for their sake I sanctify myself. He dedicated himself. What makes you dedicate it for your lives? It's the Holy Spirit, the life, the, the, the presence of God. It doesn't have to be a, a shaking presence, but something in your being... I want a change, Lord. And if we allow Him to make the change, He will make that change. But on the other hand, let's not look so loose. Well, I'm going to continue this whole life and have that go until, until He actually deals with me. That's the wrong approach. I, could, I would have to say that hunger is not there. But if the hunger is there, something comes across the word, Oh, that shouldn't be in my life. Mortify your members. Who's mortifying them? You are. But till it's actually done, it's the Holy Spirit that will actually do it. So therefore, let's not drift in looking at sanctification, cleaning our lives, going back and drifting into the, that old Pentecostal doctrine of eradication of the flesh. There's a fine line... Just like in anything in God's Word, you can take the Word and bend it to a certain place that it won't go, that God doesn't want it to go. All right, getting back to what I was speaking about earlier. Now, in Luther's day, what a shaking event. Picture yourself in his day. You're in the 1500s. He's in the Catholic Church. He sees all these abuses and whatnot. And the Catholic Church was having its heyday of manipulating the people. And so one day Luther, read, the scripture came to him and says, Luther, you're justified by faith what Jesus done at Calvary. Just that small revelation that came into Luther set a fire in the whole world, in the religious world. It shook that world, the world in that hour. It got so heated that the Catholic Church wanted to kill Luther. But because of the king of Germany, he was not permitted. God saw that he was there. But the things in the, in the spirit world also marries the things in the natural world. In the same time frame that Luther was on ground, there was a man by Nicholas Copernicus. Well, okay, he lived, he's a man that, he was an astrologer and a mathematician. Up to that hour, men, yes, the Catholic Church believed that the earth was flat. Or they believed that the earth was the center and the sun and everything else revolved around the earth. When Copernicus, when Nicholas Copernicus put out and showed with his telescope and mathematical figure that the earth is not the center of the universe. We revolve around the sun. That had a shaking effect in the uh, natural world just as much as Luther did on the spiritual side. They went hand in hand. Because if you look at the turmoil that his well it's if you want to call it doctrine, his theory, it was not just a theory, it was proven. And yet the majority of the world didn't want to receive it. They fought against him. They, he had a terrible time. So did Luther. When he says, the just shall live by faith. It shook the world. 
Now, when we come to Wesley, John Wesley. Now, from 1500s to the 1700s, or a little later in the 1800s when Wesley was on ground, God now picks up another man by the name of Wesley. And he preached sanctification. Yet when he, you would have thought those that followed Luther would have embraced John Wesley. But they're the very ones that fought against John Wesley. It was not the worldly person at at that time that fought John Wesley. It was the Lutherans or, or Calvin. Well, there were some other men that came in between because there was, what, a space of almost uh, 200 years between or so. And so John Wesley was there to preach sanctification, how the Spirit of God moved on him, that you have to live a holy life. But John Wesley didn't mean for later on people after him would start preaching, well, you got, then you have to... Get everything out of your life yourself through eradication of the old man. Did you know when John Wesley came on the scene as his message now shook the religious realm? That's when the Industrial Revolution started. It changed the world. Now man gets to travel a whole lot faster and going all over the place. Now we come to the time of Brother Branham. Now prior to Brother Branham, he didn't start ministering really to any effect till 1947-48. Yes, he was born in 1906. But that brings you to Azusa Street. We hear about Azusa Street and I came across two wonderful videos concerning Azusa Street on, on YouTube. One was recorded in 1970. It was an interview between two persons, two black, a, a black sister and a black brother, that was there while that was happening in Azusa Street. And they asked them what happened there. They were given their own account of what's took, taken place. And we know that how the Holy Spirit... It didn't start right fresh right off the bat till Brother Seymour came on the scene. Actually, when he went there the first time, they seemed to, it might have, it was just kind of inkling starting. But as Brother Seymour went there, there was another brother, uh, let's see what his name is here, uh, William Durham. He sort of saw it, but he had different ideas of what's taking place. Now let me back up and go a little further. Brother Seymour was in, in Texas or near Louisiana where he, when he were raised up. You're at the turn of the century. Slavery had just been abolished. They had, the whites had killed a lot of the, the, black people, the, the black people at that hour. And so he didn't get a, a, a complexion that he hated the white people at all. So he moved away from there and he went to Kentucky, to Indiana to the Evening Light Message. This was to set a stage into Brother Seymour why God would start to use him. He was preparing the ground for when he would go to Azusa Street the second time. And while he's been there he found this church. Not, I'm not lifting that church up. But in there they believe in equality. God doesn't differentiate between any race and so he stayed among them for a while but then when he went to Azusa Street the second time they locked him out because he was a black man because this other brother or these others that were white preachers believe in still believe in segregation which was wrong and so they locked him out and he went to this house uh, that he didn't know where to go and he would start praying then finally, he, they found this old building, and where he'd go in there, he'd pray 
hours at a time, seven or eight hours at a time, all night sometimes. And he would set himself on his knees and he'd have an old wooden crate and he put his head in the crate and he's praying to God. And he was in this place. He didn't put advertising or anything else. Then other people started joining himself and they felt drawn to go pray to as well. And they prayed long in those days because God was moving in that direction. And so as the numbers grew, then this old building that is, that is on Azusa Street was kind of like a barn, if you want to. Some people saw, kind of saw like it was fire around the building. <laughs> and God moved mightily in Azusa Street. And there, this brother Seymour, in the preaching in Azusa Street, was more, yes, he was emphasizing having the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. I mean, granted, that was in that, in that hour. You know, it's not the evidence, but it's, it's, a, it's a power of God that God can use in nine gifts. So as, he's, as that is going forth, as he would preach of the things that he went to when he was in Indiana concerning that, that uh, evening lights uh, mission that was there, or church, he started preaching equality, unity, and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And that's when it came to its peak. Because then God was bringing different ones into that building. And she says, and the, this uh, moderator is asking, well, what happened in those days? Well, there was a lot of speaking in tongues. Do uh, you mean uh, an unknown language? No, not just unknown language. There was Filipino that would be speaking in tongues, and I knew he didn't speak English, and he heard me. And when I spoke in English, he understood what I said. Or this uh, Japanese, the same way. God, so it was the same thing that took place in, in, the, in the early days, in the days of Pentecost. So that was all going forward. Then others started to join in the fray, and that's where the trouble came in. They, as they go back, they said, well, the black people should not fellowship in the same building as the, as the white. And in time, there's other men that rose up. And that's where, because the Holy Ghost at that hour was cleaning the vessel. They didn't have the, well, I shouldn't do this, shouldn't do that. The Holy Spirit was just moving things out of their lives. Even little children, they said, little children that could hardly talk, came in. The Holy Spirit would fall on them and they would speak in perfect English. Prophesy. Speaking in tongues. Oh, it would have been wonderful to... But that's joyous. But that was just God starting the, the whole situation. But then men got into the picture by 19, 12 to 14. Yes, we believe in, in the Holy Ghost and the speaking in tongues and... We believe, souls will believe the second work of grace, which is the eradication of the old man. Which, and that split Pentecost. Not only that split Pentecost, because later on God starts to show a certain brother that they need to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, rather than Trinity. And there was a warfare. It, was, it got heated. That's why when he says, the Lord says, I will send a fire, a fire puts the true child on, on fire for him and it irritates the, the tear. So, I mean, it's been all through history. To a greater amount, you've seen it at the turn of the century. But it happened in Luther's day, in Wesley's day, in Brother Branham, in, in the days of Azusa Street. And when it came to time for Brother Branham, God started with the gift after World War II, wanted to touch every walk of life that would want to come in, and then the gifts were in operation. I would have loved to see in some of those days, but there may be days ahead here, because there's nine spiritual gifts going to be operating. And so as that drew people, and, and, and you hear sometimes, well, Brother Brown was such a meek and nice person. Yes, he was in those days. But when he started preaching the word, I don't know, Jude, like I said, I've listened to some of his sermons that he preached from 1964 or 1965. It's not that quiet, wonderful preacher in a sense. 
He didn't change. God got him to be stern on trying to bring a message now, getting the bride to wake up. Now, our sanctification, and, and I'll bring that in in a moment. So as he's getting to the place where he starts speaking the words, the Pentecostal that came from Azusa Street that's seen it the right way, the, the one that's... They should have embraced the prophet. But they're the very ones that fought him. It was not the man of the world or the cold denominational church. It was those from the previous move that was against the prophet of the hour. And then when that prophet moves off the scene, then God brings an apostle on the scene. And my, oh my, the same thing repeats again. Well, Lord, don't, why don't you stop this stuff? It's God's ways of separating things. He knows who is a true believer and who is not. And so did the majority of Brother Branham, did they follow on? No, they didn't. They actually fought against the apostle of the hour. Now, if that's been history all the way along, what do you think is going to happen? It's different maybe in the fivefold ministry now, in this hour. It's not. The same thing is transpiring. Then I heard some of the things that Brother Brown was talking about. He said, uh, Now, I was sanctified, remember, we're sanctified by the blood of Christ... That's pertaining the old, unbelieving, unregenerated man. And what is the mind of God in all of this? He wants to take man from the days of Pentecost to grow it up on his word that be a bride fully dressed with his revelated word for each one of their days. No the, in the days of Paul or even the days of Uranus and so forth, they all have the bride garment. But God's own, God only holds them responsible for the word of their day. He was not holding all those through the whole grace age to have that white garment of revelation on the basis of trying to get the old man in shape. It's based on the word of God. When Jesus says, I sanctify myself, I dedicate myself. And what caused him to dedicate himself? Because the father was talking to him. He was alive. To any of these men that God used, it's because of the word in their hour that made them alive. So I heard the prophet say, Noah in his day, he couldn't start preaching Enoch's message. It wouldn't have worked. But yet, that was part to carry in in that understanding. And Moses couldn't preach Noah's message. You've got to build an ark to go across the Red Sea now. It didn't work. Yet, from the things that God used in Noah or all the word that God had brought over time, it's part of. But God now is adding more to the picture. And when you come to Elijah, Elisha, the prophet Daniel, God was continually adding more understanding of his plan of salvation. It's what he deems important. Because when we talk about faithful Abraham... Abraham was made righteous by the things he believed for his day because he had a personal word from the Lord and God honored it and said, Abraham, you're righteous. Now, there's more to it than that. He was a lot of things, Abraham, because he's the father of faith. And so it's built upon that word that he received in his day. Now we come to the Hour that in the period of time that we're living in now. 
God has a word for each move, every man that he brings on the scene. When Brother Brown came on the scene, he didn't say, well, we don't need Luther, we don't need Wesley. It was part of, but God gave him some things that, that go beyond that. Because it was God wanting to put more of his revelated word of his plan. And the revelated word of his plan is in this much. The, we, the fine linen that the bride's putting on, the wedding garment. What is it? It's a garment of revelation. It's not a garment of eradication of the old man. The Holy Ghost that deals with the inner man, there is the, the, the blood is imputed to you and I. Yes, the inner man needs to be have the Holy Spirit to for justification, sanctification, baptism, Holy Ghost, predestination, and all those things is needed to be in him. But that's not your full garment. That's the inner man's garment that God sees, and it's through the Word. But the garment that the bride is putting on, she has every revelation from way back when. Even to the hour that she's living, because when we come, when she comes ready for the rapture, and we want to go to Revelation chapter 19, 19 now. And in Revelation chapter 19, and we've read this so many times, but do we understand the full scope? Let us be glad and rejoice. Who's going to be glad and rejoicing? The true child of God is. And give honor to him because the thing that we are going to be dressed with the honor belongs to the Lord no man deserves any honor the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready how was she made ready was just the, the teaching of Jesus and the doctrines of the apostles by every revelated word, even to the point right before the breaking of that seventh seal. She's made ready. Now, she didn't do it herself. It's the Holy Spirit that has been on her, that she takes that revelated word that puts on that revelatory garment. And if I be a, a believer or or an intellectual believer that just stayed in Brother Branham's hour and the seventh seal is broke now, if you're listening to on the internet, at the time of the seventh seal is broke, I do not have a full revelatory garment for that hour. I have a mini skirt. You don't have all this truth. And it says here, and the bride has made herself ready by the Spirit of God. Now, if it pertains to just other things, the bride should have been made ready. If you've got other ideas, the bride, was the bride made ready in the days Brother Branham was on the scene? Or Luther? Or, or Brother Jackson? These were all stepping stones that God was getting her ready for her revelatory garment. That's what she's putting on. And it says here, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, the most costliest apparel, the most costly truth. White, for the white linen is the righteousness of the saints. Why is the, the bride is her righteousness? Because it stems, if you want to look at it, it's what was told to Abraham. Because Abraham believed God for the word for his day, he was counted for righteousness. And here in this verse, when the bride is standing there 
arrayed in fine linen, she was made righteous because she believed the word for her day. And now, and sometimes when I speak like that, I make it sound, well, it's just a revelation of this day. No, it's all that entails for whole salvation. But it needed the revelation for his hour or our hour. So when we look at righteousness, what makes you and I right? Righteousness. Because we believe the word of God for our day, whatever period of time that person would live in. And I know that maybe sometimes it's used to, as an excuse. When I, talked about revelato- when I talked about intellectual believers, of all the intellectual believers that didn't move, that stayed in Brother Branham's day, and I'll use that as an example. As the overall, they are intellectual believers. But in among there could be a true child of God. And when God deems to bring that child along, he will see the truth for the day that when God wakes him up. So not it's not a 100% total intellectual believer, but when you look at the whole Situation, I'll put it this way. Are those that followed Brother Branham and stayed in his revelation, when the seventh seal is broke, now I'd like you to tell me what category do they fit? Are they bride? White robes? Foolish virgins? Or intellectual believers? What differs them than the Pentecostal? What differs them from the days of John Wesley that wouldn't accept the Pentecostal message? What differs from the group from Luther not accepting Wesley's message? It's the word for your day and your hour that God's looking at to see you righteous. Yes, it incorporates everything that's brought up to that hour. Is this clear this morning? All right. Now, I'm going to probably play a little video for you. There's this notion about the fivefold ministry. Yes, it acts as the head of Christ on earth, but not all fivefold is of an equal nature in God's eyes. He's going to have pastors, evangelists, teachers, prophets, and apostles. Plural. But if we're talking about headship, Jesus is the head. But who is he going to direct his headship with? A pastor? No. He's going to deal with an apostolic type of a ministry. That's why he started with the head first with Brother Jackson introducing that he was part of the fivefold ministry, but he was used to feed those that would come later on in this move here. Now being and I was asked, well are you that are you trying to make yourself a chief apostle? No. There's more than one apostle. And there may be somebody sitting in the wings that God will use more than I will. But not all the full five full of the ministry is going to be apostles. Forget that. That is an error. That will never put the body together. Oh yeah, but Jesus used all five together. Yes, as is in line with headship. It's like headship in anywhere in the world. If you have a country that has a government... There's somebody at the head of it. But he depends on his ministers and everything else to be functional. But he's the one that makes the decisions. Now, that's in the natural side of things. But in the fivefold ministry, we know there's going to be more than one, but there's not going to be a dozen of apostles. So I'm just one of the apostles that God may be using for this period of time. There may be someone else God may raise up with more light than I have. 
And praise God, I pray that he does. Because I would take the heat out from here. But I'm going to play something about what Brother Jackson said about this fivefold ministry. And one of the comments that he's going to put there, he says, he's, he's speaking about himself, well, you preach too hard. Let's just love Jesus. What did he mean by that? Now we'll play the video. Uh, I, oh, maybe I'll use the speakers where on this thing? Underneath? Okay, we'll try to get it here. Like this this morning is. When people absolutely begin to think about unity, they've got to begin to realize there's absolutely going to come a time you're going to lose some friends. Because as you absolutely begin to pull away, you might find yourself walking in another direction. As I stand here this morning, around this world, I thank God that I've stood for this truth. I've done everything I know under this sun to support, to encourage other men who were ministers. But I've also come to the realization, brothers and sisters, others have come into the, into the thing, hoping eventually they can outrun you and be a little bigger than you. You think I don't know that? I have to say, brothers and sisters, when God laid upon my heart years ago to stand for this man's truth, he never did tell me to run a race with anybody. I got in the back of my Bible a prophecy. One night when I went to pray, I was praying, Lord, help me to understand this word. Help me that I might be able to break this down to your people. This was long before the seals was preached and before the church ages. When all of a sudden something came on me and I stopped praying. And suddenly words came into my mouth. My son, I will be with you to direct thee and thy pathway and to guide thee in all the ways wherein I would have thee to walk. For the day will come you will be looked down upon by men and rejected up by many. And brothers and sisters, at that time I thought everybody loved me. Brother Branham was still alive. We was all going to the tabernacle every time Brother Branham was there. But oh, my brothers and sisters, when Brother Branham is gone, then I begin to see how many men there are. They look down upon you, and they reject you. We don't watch you. I'll never forget one time, sisters, through these 39 years, 30, 35 years that we've been publishing, I've read what other men have said, and I have to say the time has come. God's going to take somebody's message. And he's going to take some men that have a revelation. And they're going to start putting that thing together. It's going to form a picture. And there's a nucleus of people that are going to, going to begin to believe it. They're not even going to care who it hurts or what the name is. Because that's the truth. I have to say this morning. God will not start with a group of men. 
He will start with the voice of one man that will lift up the word strong enough, loud enough, that those men will know God's in it. Then when you follow this, all through the book of Acts, a few days later, Peter and John now was on their way to the temple. They passed by where there was a crippled man lay. He had been laying there many, many other times as Jesus came by, no doubt. And he looked to Jesus for help, but didn't get it. But on this particular morning, as Peter and John come walking by, I could just see him reach out his hands for some help. And they said, look on us. And they spoke the word, and God made him whole. From then on, brothers and sisters, you begin to see where other men begin to come into the picture. And that's what I'm saying this morning. If there's unity, there's got to be the voice of one man who all the other men will get aligned with. That, I realize that sounds like to some people, well, that ain't, that ain't the way I thought it was going to be. In other words, that's not the way you want it to be. That's what it sounds like. But I have to say, if what we have put in print for the past 35 years, brothers and sisters, God's going to confirm it, and I have to say, it's a framework. People have built their faith around it. And I have to say this morning, always remember, brothers and sisters, the birth of anything, you get the head first. You get the head first. I've helped horses, cows, sheep, all kinds of farm animals bear their young into this world. Brother Pixley, when you get a, an animal that's a breech birth, you've got problems. When you get feet first, nine times out of ten you get death. I mean, that's what I mean. I say that with respect. And what I'm saying this morning, the head's got to be set in motion first. That head's got, and that head don't have to be one man, but it starts with one man. As that one man speaks, other components of the head join with it. And then when the body begins to see that the head's taken shape, then the p people can begin to say, as for me and my house, we're going to go that way. So this morning, brothers and sisters, it's not big I and little you. It's not Dr. Doolittle. But it's brethren that God has known. And I have to say today, God's going to put his head in shape. That head's got to speak, Jesse. I thank God the army has run different in the church world. When a general, general steps out on the parade ground, whatever command he gives, that's heralded right on down through the colonel or the major or the captain, right through the lieutenant, to the sergeant, to the corporal. It goes right on down. And I have to say, if you're in the army, you're usually assigned to a platoon. And you don't, well, I don't want to be in that platoon. I don't like to stand with him. So you go and get, get back there where you belong. I'm just using it as an illustration. The body of Christ cannot be a nucleus of people running here and there with their ideas. Well, I don't like to hear him preach. He's too rough. Let's follow Jesus. Come on, let's follow Jesus. He 
said something one day about the time was going to come when they was going to kill him. And boy, that old hot-headed Peter, he's bless God, as long as I'm alive, they're not going to touch you. That sweet, soft-spoken Jesus. Now, Peter, you're such a nice little fellow. Get behind me, Satan! You don't even understand the things of God. That's the way he spoke. But see, some people just jerk out of the word what they want. I think this as long as this. And I'm not talking like this to be mean. But I know people absolutely, they get their minds all crossed up. So my point is, brothers and sisters, God's got some men on the earth today. They are parts of that head. And that head is not chosen by the body. God chose it. And when that head starts speaking, God depends that there is now reaction from the body. Unity, reactions, development. And I have seen people, brothers and sisters, come through these doors through the years. I ask myself many times, where in this world are they going to? Now, just to finish things up, let me put the microphone back on. Yes. Now, when God calls you, you don't plan on everything that, oh, you're going to be something, make something. It's in you on fire what he gives you to preach. And like I was mentioning about, Moses couldn't have used Noah's message. Brother Branham couldn't use a Pentecostal message. Brother Jackson couldn't just preach Brother Branham's message. And neither in this hour can we just preach Brother Jackson's message. It's part of. Because otherwise, if it's not necessary, then the whole garment has been provided back here. I'm here to say it. Thus saith the Lord, it's not. There's thing in this hour. And it, like I said, there's more than one apostle that I know of. But not everybody is one. And if it, there is one, it'll take this scripture and make such a beautiful picture alive. I got a letter this week. What now what's sort of going on? I tried to get in touch with the, the brother a couple of times, but the phone was busy. And this weekend, it's been really busy, especially with our, the... This thing was going on in the house and my stepfather and everything else has taken place. So maybe when I get the time, I will. But then, as you get to live like that and sometimes it gets you, well, what are they thinking about? Sometimes some things are not encouraging. It didn't go 15 minutes. I get a phone call from a brother not from this area. He says, I enjoyed that message. It sets things clear. Well, that lift, you don't know how much that lifted me up. Not that I need to be lifted up, but sometimes there are things that comes. Uh, well, well, just like your, the trials of uh, Paul and Gary, some of these trials can be pretty heavy at times. But if we hold steady and with, with the word of God, God will see you through. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. So, yes, if there is someone to speak in this hour, he's going to have to speak loud enough because none of the movement is hearing anything. That's why God has allowed it to be shaken. Not to destroy anyone, 
Well, let's just stop. Well, hey, we're living in this, this uh, third watch. Well, I don't know about this third watch. Jesus spoke about in in Luke chapter 12. What about if I come in a second watch or a third watch? If he didn't meant to be a third one, he'd have never mentioned it. And how beautiful when you see, if you want to see the picture, it's there. doesn't answer everything. But praise God. Well, I've said enough of this morning. There's another thing I want to say, but I, I can't because for the sake of other churches, I'm going to wait. God will. And I don't have to do anything. God's going to do it all anyway. No, he regards what we want to do. He's going to, the Lord's going to have his way. But I'm thankful. I've got peace and I love God's word. I don't know about you. I can see the picture more clearly of this bride coming now, being dressed in these final hours. There is, I'm glad God says something during this fivefold ministry. And I don't have to be the only one that's going to shout from the quarters of heaven. Now, I don't mean to use the brother's name again, but the brother governor. Every, every time I talk to him, I says, carry on. Go a little further. <laughs> but you can only go as far as God leads you. I understand that. You can't just make it. You can't do it. It's that God leads you. It just drops in. and So praise the Lord. So anyway, I'm not asking anyone even here to follow my coattail. If the Holy Spirit is showing this to you, then you thank God. We're, there's no big eyes and small you. I'd rather be a small you playing the guitar right over there where I used to be. It was a whole lot easier. A whole lot easier. Not that I'm a good big guitar player. I just pluck away like a, you pluck at a chicken. So praise the Lord. Let's just stand at this time. If there's a, still a need, if the musician would come, and then uh, we'll have maybe one hymn, and then, uh, and then we'll dismiss from there. So praise the Lord. One seventy three. Just do the chorus. What is it called? One seventy three. Just sing the chorus. Thank you. Through it all. trust in God through it all through it all I've learned to depend upon God's word through it all through trust in Jesus I've learned to trust in God through it all thank you Lord through it all I've learned to depend upon God's word through it all Trust in Jesus, I've learned to trust in God through it all, through it all. I've learned to depend 
upon God's Word. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through upon God's word. Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful, Lord, for this opportunity to gather together this morning, Father, and to hear your word. Father, we pray, Lord, that you would give us understanding in our hearts, wisdom, Father. Father, we pray, be with each one as, as we would make our way home. Abide in our hearts, in our lives. Father, may you be upon our heart, Father. Help us, Lord, to always bridle our tongue, Father, and to be an example, Father. Lord, that people may see you living in us, Father. And I just pray, Father, that your will is done. And we ask for traveling mercies upon the highway, Lord. And Father, we give you thanks. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord.